the first is not the problem of the state. Problem is uh, the future. What is the future? You know, I remember a text by uh, Jean Baudrillard of 1998, where he wrote that uh, there won't be future because uh, we are in postmodern age, and in postmodern age, the future is not possible. Who said that? Never mind. Uh, who said that? Is it possible? Boudria. 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 Uh, we live in uh, eternal present. In eternal present time. And, uh, you know, it's interesting because uh, I think that uh, while looking at the Middle East, we have so many visions, 2030, 2040, uh, so many strategic visions, but we don't have any develop a real development. We have a lot of events, we have a lot of, uh, a lot of things to discuss, but uh, in fact we don't have uh, any uh, real uh, development and uh, uh, real uh, uh, strategy. And, and uh, in the situation of uh, eternal present, the development is not possible. It's normal. When something happens, something happens every time, always, but nothing develops. Uh, and, and if you look if we look at uh, the situation, the future, not as a, as a future, but uh, as an eternal present time, we can think that it should be some mix of uh, experience of the region, past experience of the region. Uh, and uh, talking about, and it is the second issue is the state, about the, uh, about the state. I think that we had historically we had uh, two important experiences of uh, states of statehood in the region. Maybe we had more than two, but during the last uh, 1,000 and 400 years we had two. We had uh, Islamic experience, Muslim experience, and we have modern experience. Uh, talk, uh, traditional Muslim experience of state build, of statehood, what, what it was in medieval age, in modern age, before colonialism. It was multilateral statehood. We have uh, not theodal in the European sense, but multilateral, m m multilateral, sorry, not multilateral, multilateral state. On the basic level, we had uh, we have different protester systems, like militias, under uh, the today, Fatuwa, Ayalun, Ayal, and so on, in Baghdad, in, uh, in Cairo, and so on. And if you look at the uh, sources, if you, look, if you read. Uh, history of uh, popular movements on the Middle East, on the Middle East in Baghdad. Now I read the uh, history of popular movements in Baghdad in the 10th century. It's the absolutely the same story about Libya of today. There is nothing different except Kalashnikov. <laughs> yes, it's, uh, Kalashnikov is important. You <laughs> <Sure>. for people. <laughs> uh, and uh, very important thing that uh, this uh, Futuwa, uh, that not only in militias too, they're not only uh, gunsters, bands, and so on. They have their own ethics, they have their own principles, they have uh, their own values, they have their own identity. And uh, the funny thing that uh, reading the sources, usually, you, you can see, especially in popular literature, you can see positive, uh, positive vision, po po positive uh, vision of the of, of the ideas, You know, there is no uh, negative uh, 
the word is in Russian. There was a post in Russian. Okay. Uh, and uh, at the same time, there was an official state. Uh, and legit legitimacy, legitimacy of which uh, was uh, it, it, it had a religious legitimacy from Caliph, from Khalifa. Even after the 11th century, uh, after separation between Khalifa and Sultan. Khalifa gave, uh, Khalifa gave, gave, gave legitimacy to the state. Conceptually, on the conceptual level, it was a religious state. Even, even in fact, on, in practice, it was a secular state, close to Anglo-Saxon model. Because you, you, you can't find uh, any, any religious motivated uh, actors, uh, sultans uh, in the region of this time. So, uh, and this secular state, this secular system of power based on praetorians, like the modern state, modern authoritarian uh, state, about uh, uh, us about all this uh, all this, uh, with all these uh, policies and so on. Nothing changed. And these two levels, they uh, coexisted and uh, interacted. And in the 20th century we had a new state. Modern state was, which was exported to the Middle East from the Europe, from the Glorious and so on. And today we can see, I think, all the three models. The Protestant model, the traditional uh, Islamic model, and the contemporary modern European model, which are co coexisted, uh, which uh, co coexist in the region, the interaction uh, in the region, so on. And uh, while we're talking about democracy, liberal, uh, liberal liberalism and uh, state building, national building. It is a continuation of tradition of export of European paradigm, paradigm, uh, methodological paradigm, uh, European uh, thinking to the region. And we don't include in our analysis the traditional uh, ways of uh, existing and of political organization. I'm not sure that uh, that our uh, European, including Russia, I mean, yes, with some specificity, but including Russia, that uh, Western uh, experience is universal. Not only experience of uh, state building, of national building, of governance, but experience of thinking about it. Maybe we should find some new uh, possibi some possibility, some new methodology, methodology to think about Earth state in Earth methodological paradigm. Uh, talking about the uh, state of the future, so I think that uh, it would be quite reasonable to Sure, we know what will be there in 100 years, we don't know what will be tomorrow, but uh, there are several quite clear things. I agree with uh, almost uh, everything what uh, my colleagues uh, talk about, but I think that uh, there will be this problem of profound, not deep state, but profound state, that we have uh, a huge part of societies uh, who can live without the state. They organize, that's why there are uh, no state actors, militias, who do iron, etc., etc., et 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 the same situation. They don't, need, they don't need a state, in fact. Uh, and uh, it will exist. Uh, we'll see, uh, sure, it will be the religion will keep its role, but I think that uh, the process of shiitization of the religion will go on. Shia. 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 
We have, uh, then officially we have about one billion of Shia in Algeria, we have, then officially, uh, by uh, some experts, uh, about uh, 20,000 uh, Shia in Tunisia. I don't know, nobody knows how many in Libya or in Egypt, but Tunisia or Algerian countries were, 10 years ago, they were, in Tunisia officially, they, we had, uh, 200 people shy, and now 20,000. And in Algeria, do you know? In Algeria, I think it was, it was less than 1,000. And now? And now they're talking about a million. Mm -hmm. no. Algeria, Come on. one million. Yeah, shy in Algeria. Uh, it's, uh, it was not my fantasy. Uh, it's uh, the index of uh, Algerian uh, social, sociologist of religion of the uh, University of uh, Algeria. They think about, about some places. Why? Sure, maybe because of uh, Iranian culture centers, but not only. While we accuse uh, Iran in everything, in Shantanation, and uh, we, it's, our, it's the same mistake we made every, uh, always, not because of Iran, because Shia was always uh, Shia always was was a way uh, of response of answer to injustice and so on and so on. And it gives it gives us this role. There is this uh, people. Uh, there was Ikhwan way, Ikhwan way. There were most brotherhood. It failed. There was some of the strength. It failed. There, there are no secular ideology who can uh, offer something new. Finally, if you are a young protester man in Algeria, for example, or in Tunisia, and you are tired of a mother or with a fleet or something else like that. You can uh, be converted to Shem. The third, uh, the third uh, moment is uh, about the state of the future. Uh, the fourth is uh, the democratic, uh, democratic uh, pace in which of all the systems. Sure, they it will exist, but it's interesting also how there is this special, specific, uh, a special Arabic tradition of reinterpretation of uh, and of of reinterpretation of uh, export, uh, exported uh, ideas and terms. For example, uh, today uh, Alexander Senor uh, discussed the problem of federalization of Libya. Okay, we, we can t talk about federalization of Libya, of Syria, of, of, or of Iraq. But do we think, what, what do we mean talking about federalization when we're talking about Libya or Iraq or Syria? It is something new, it is something quite different than we talk about, than we talk about uh, I don't know, United States or even Russia. It's something different. It is uh, the democratic uh, institutions, formerly democratic institutions, sure they will stay, but uh, the, the new content and uh, new, uh, by, uh, they will be more and more specified. Uh, and uh, more, they, there will be the process of Arabization or Middle Easternization or Islamization of these institutions. I stop. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I think, yes, I will stop here. Yeah. And, uh, so, thank you very much. Uh, so, we are doing well with the timing. Because I wanted, uh, after all the presentation, uh, the audience to participate in the discussion. And, uh, I think that there was some uh, 
put for thought and maybe we have to leave to, to, to leave. We'll mm -hmm. so have some 20 minutes and uh, um, I believe we can limit your questions or remarks to three, four minutes. Uh, so, uh, so the, the question so yours, the then, then yours, and then yours. Yeah. But they are influential. Right. This uh, session was really inter um, interesting, very intellectual, stimulating. I've, I've got a few points that will really touch upon things that everybody talked about. I like the point about technology, especially. If we're going to try and maybe use our imagination a little bit and just see what different possibilities there are and then based upon what has happened in the past. One of the things that links the issue of technology is the decline in deep, big institutions and big organizations in favor of networks. And who will that favor in the future? So the rise of institutions, so a lot of the state building policies are really about making Arab governance institutions effective at implementing policy. The rise of the idea of the Western efficient productive institution is a result of particular developments that did not really happen in the Arab world or happen in a different way in the third world in general. So when people talk about the kind of the the rise of Europe and the rise of the West, it's really kind of the triple revolutions theory, the, the English, French and industrial revolutions, with the industrial revolution really increasing the discussion and the necessity for efficiency, for productivity, for targets, and then implementing that within institutions, making institutions productive and efficient in an industrial way, which didn't happen in our part of the world. This then led to European hegemony over finance and economics and led to the decline of the Arab Islamic world economically before militarily because they were in debt to Europe uh, and that debt and the failure to pay off the interest on the debt indirectly led then to colonization. So for the past thousand years or so, well, much of the world, not just the Arab world, there was a center of, as you said, religious legitimacy a center of sovereign power and sovereign functions, particularly military. And the rest was all decentralized. Even diplomatically, some of the decentralized regions had sometimes independent diplomatic and foreign relations that sometimes contradicted. You had alternative forms of legitimacy, alternative forms of religious legitimacy, alternative forms of trade governance. All of these things were declined because they were seen as inefficient and ineffective because they failed to counteract uh, the industrial efficiency of the West. But what I see happening now and in the future are actually very similar dynamics but covertly, not overtly. So instead of having an overt global empire, what I see now is a covert empire where you have multiple centers of power. Um, so I would say, you know, Washington DC kind of like the capital of the Imperium, the West in general having this kind of still a hegemony over finance and economics and the global economic system, and everybody else integrating into it in a very kind of superficial way. Um, and now in the region, they understand this very well. And now there is a competition about who's going to be the center of sovereign power for the region in a federal region that isn't named federal. So the, the nation states are still the same, Libya, Egypt, Somalia, uh, Gulf countries. So in the UN, they're still independent members. But in reality, Iran, Abu Dhabi, Istanbul, uh, Ankara, they're vying for who's going to be the new center of sovereign power and the new covert empire. And they're using really covert means to implement that policy. Uh, inter military and intelligence interventions in the west of Africa in Yemen, in North Africa, um, all of these things, and, and China the same way. But they won't seek to overtly challenge the new, the post-World War II world order, which means that they can maintain a level of cover and legitimacy. The other thing that was mentioned, which is very correct, is that in the Arab world, we're not really military dictatorships, military states. We are Mukhabarat states. We are actually completely ineffective militarily. 
and we have to ask ourselves why. Why are we very effective, for example, in jihad, but very ineffective in organized military or institutions? This is a very important question. It's because the, it goes back to this issue of institutions. and So we have to really rethink the nature of every single organization we're trying to implement. Most state building and even SSR are really trying to build these traditional military institutions that were effective for the West. They're not effective for us. Um, technology is speeding up. And now the new reality in the rest of the next 50 years is going to be more fluid networks, and I see certain organizations going to be leading the way. So I see an expansion in the role of um, kind of stateless, borderless networks, which includes multinational corporations, it includes mafias, it includes non-state actors, it includes and will be led by, I think, uh, intelligence agencies. I think many of the, the institutions that will survive in the region unfortunately, and uh, in the world, who are functioning according to how Silicon Valley is functioning. <laughs> Startups that move freely and don't respect borders and can operate anywhere in completely flexible and immediate fashion, with immediate results, um, will be these type of organizations and intelligence agencies. And, and they might have an agenda or a plan that is completely contrary to anything that what we're talking about, what academics are talking about, what's in the political discussion in the agenda, but the new reality will be dictated. Thank you so much. Uh, Gabriella. Thank you. Ah, okay. Um, well, I too it was a, a very lively, interesting session, and I, I, I just want to pick up some of the things that I latch on to, things like what does pragmatism mean, the ideas of magic theory, and then the, one of your points about managing radical difference and your diagnosis that the Middle East was pretty sick. But actually it made me pause and it made me think the West also has to diagnose its sickness as well. And there could be an area of reciprocity here and an area in which we can learn from each other. And I think the, some of the sickness of the West is around alienation, and on me, we're the century of now, 21st century is the century of loneliness, isolation. I, I, ha I have one colleague who's um, a very senior reporter on Syria, and he actually said to me, he's living in the UK, and he said, I'd rather be in a cafe in Damascus than in London. And I think that's because there is something in the in Middle East culture around community and family and warmth and connectedness. And you know, I when I sit with some Islamic groups, they say, but you don't look after your old people. Your divorce rate is very high. So I think we'll get do better in terms of nudge theory or incentivizing or some kind of exchange if we're more reciprocal. If our diagnosis is not only their problems, I think we also need to look at some of our problems and what's the scope in which we can learn from each other. Thank you very much. Yes, I agree that this was a fascinating session. Uh, and it seems to me, I, I just come to one basic point about the state of tomorrow. And I would like to submit that to all participants. And I'll take John and Abdurrahman. The idea is that we are divided with what to start. Nation building or state building. And I think we need really to look at that and decide. Mm -hmm. I am divided, I have been divided, but I came to the idea that it is state building that we start with. Not only because nation building takes years yeah. to achieve, but perhaps as a political scientist, I am very impressed by Hobbes and Leviathan. He founded the community in fragmentation. That was four centuries ago. And came and said, you need an authority to organize things. And we need an authority to organize things. If we don't have a chair, there will be chaos. 
You need an authority. A good authority. That's the point. Now, to 70%, this is data, 70% of the countries of the world are ethnically divided. But we don't have 70 countries in civil war. The difference is that the authority, some authority, knows how to manage the fragmentation and the conflict in society. I'm, I'm, I'm just presenting the dialectic to you and perhaps saying to you where I stand, but I would like us really to discuss that because it is not as consensual as I am presenting. Can we really do it? Hmm? Can we really discuss it? Can you yeah. really, really discuss the statements that you have made right now? Yeah, yeah, I, I'm, I'm just giving some of the data in support, and then if the chair decides that this is the point that we have to discuss, we can discuss, but we have been divided about that, and I think this is the basic point for tomorrow. Tomorrow. How to start? No. It's the state of tomorrow. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> that is the title of the panel. You mentioned John uh, Ottawa and the UAE. I am familiar with the project in the UAE. They established first the state, then they are working now on the nation. And they are establishing compulsory military service to uh, bring the uh, identity of the federal structure. But they started with the state. It is the most advanced country in the government. All of that is the Bible, assured by the state. Let me just finish so that I, I don't take too much time. But I wanted to, to put that question really to the participants in the last session. What about the criticism of the state that we have been dealing with during the day? And my thinking about that, if the Arab world has the highest traffic accident almost in the global south, do we need, in this case, to abolish the car? or improve the road system, educate the driver, establish good traffic lights, and put laws that are respected and enforced. And this can be done by the state. I, I have put my uh, position very categorically, but as I said, I'm not as categorical as that. I am divided, but if you want, the world of tomorrow, we need both nation building and state building. But where to start? Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Omar. If you can take this microphone. Uh, thank you. I have a brief comment on uh, John's presentation and a question for Basi. Um, so I completely agree with you that the, the problem can be distilled to the absence of conflict resolution methods and actually um, as an Arab living in an Arab country I see that microcosmically at the family level, at the organization level whereby people can't resolve conflicts. It's one of the reasons I reject the accusation that it's foreign entities that are, uh, you know, people who are power that are destroying functional releases because I see exactly the same problems at the government level, at the family level, and there's no way I can blame <laughs> You know, me, me, me. American imperialism for the fact that someone can't get home with their brother or doesn't know how to, uh, you know, make up with their wife or something like that. Um, but I would say, and then when you mentioned that Arabs need to learn to work it out for themselves, so in Bahrain, we have a parliament, we have elections coming up in November. The parliament was established in 2002, and among the many problems we have with our parliament is that people are in, in consistently, in my opinion, elect really bad really incompetent uh, people to be uh, representatives in parliament. But, uh, and I think the solution for that is for them to keep electing bad people and realizing that these are ineffective people and then eventually they'll work out that stuff. So I think there is a process and it will come with time. Um, obviously, you know, it's a place like the UK have been doing it for much longer. But I think, I think that what you said will work, which is eventually, if you, they will 
maybe a little bit of a lot of pain, a lot of death, a lot of tears and blood in the way, but eventually people will work out that whatever is going on in the prison um, uh, needs to be re reformed. Uh, Vasily, a uh, question for you. So you mentioned, <laughs> so you mentioned that uh, the reason people are turning to Shiism is that because of the injustice. I absolutely agree with you that there's injustice, but Shiism is not the only alternative available. They can become communists, they can become nationalists, they can become there's a million different ideologies. Uh, so for sure, it can't just be the case that you know, you know, there's many many people trying to export ideologies. So you can't just blame on the country that's exporting the ideology, but one of those ideologies is sticking and lots of the others aren't. So you can't just say, well, they're turning to Shiism because it's injustice, full stop. There's lots of other things they could be turning to. Why is it they're turning to Shiism and not turning to communism, to capitalism, to any one of the numerous um, political systems or, or ideological uh, um, beliefs that haven't been adopted or fully implemented. I agree with you, for example, the Ikhwani solution hasn't worked fine. You know, because it's not like the only choice in the world is between being Ikhwani and being Shia. There's, there's even, you can, there's even other sects in Islam, let alone different religions and different uh, ideology. You can become a Sufi, you can become a... Uh, 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 you know. So there's also alternatives. Why then are they showing to Shiism and not any of those, one of the millions of alternatives that could exist? Thank you. Thank you. Just I mean, a, a comment, a footnote to what John says. A comment, a footnote to what John says. The, uh, this dichotomy of a strong state or strong civil society, what comes first. I think that goes hand in hand. Like you just say, I mean, practicing authoritarian modernization, but internalizing modernity and modernization from below. This is something that I mean, we did in the last hundred years in Middle East. And other part of the world is that uh, nowadays, as I said in the first part of my talk, I mean, we have gotten in these regimes that they are frightening people of civilization of the country by you know, marginalizing the position. And they say that, okay, either us or help. So you don't have any choice. So they just, I mean, go I mean, for this, uh, practicing this uh, aggressive I mean, policies towards I mean, the opposition. So how can they practice uh, meritocracy, stop nepotism, things like that, not dividing society between us and others? As far as, I mean, this morning, I mean, Valian said about, I mean, this, 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 does the intervention correct or not? I mean, my opinion, I think yes. I yes to intervention. Yes, but what type of intervention? Not by individual countries, but by international bodies. I talk about my own experience it worked for the many years for the Organization of Security and Cooperation in Europe, and I don't want to glorify them in OSCE, but I think to a large extent, the experience of OSCE was really good, and we can learn from that in Middle East. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, uh, actually, um, uh, uh, we were, uh, I was participating a few days ago, in a conference at Birzeit University in Palestine about how we can study Israel. <laughs> so this was uh, the conclusion of that point. And now I will tell you why we uh, had this discussion. Because we thought for ourselves that we are using a lot of Israeli uh, way of thinking, mainly when we study the old history of Palestine. Yeah? There is a lot of Israelized in the old, when we're talking about the old city, but the old history of Palestine, so we, this was a kind of critical, you know, conference to discuss this again and to see how we really can discuss Israel. Today, we reached the point with Vasili and all the other speakers on the issue on how we can study ourselves as a matter of world. And actually, I will go back from here with this point of thought. Uh, are we uh, studying ourselves in the sense according to um, uh, the concepts of liberalism? Liberalism. If I go back to the to the concepts of liberalism, I see that um, uh, we talk about cohesive citizenship, celebrating diversity, state institutions, transfer, and start. And all of this, I will not go to all of this language that we already uh, already uh, already know. Now but we know from our history 
including the Ottoman period. We do not need to go to the old history of the 10th century. This was the Ottoman period. As much as the state is there, and the state gets its kharaj, according to Sabir Amin, translated to the kharaj, the kharajiyya, the state that gets, you know, this is Sabir Amin, he invented this concept. It gets a kharaj. It's a kind of tax. 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 Thank you. It gets the tax. Then the communities are free to do whatever they want. Now, the communities, some of them are uh, organized according a long familial relationship or a clannish relationship. But they can live in just, just uh, uh, besides each other without problems. And this was the case. Of course, there was a problem. But I'm just you know, trying to say that this is also a possibility without going to this complicated, uh, very complicated liberal way of thinking. And then we come to our society and try to create some kind of social engineering. Social engineering. Maybe the difficulty is in the social engineering more than about creating a kind of structure that uh, go beyond beyond that. My final point on this, just in, in this code of thought, is the nation state. I'm not talking about nation building. I'm talking about the nation state. It was the division of Morocco. The Great Morocco it was done between France and Britain. Then followed by Sykes Picot. So all the states in the Middle East, these national states, are you know, artificial, artificial states. So and you said about them what Malik thought about, told, said about wine. Okay? This is an Arabic example. Okay? Malik, when Malik spoke about wine, he made all the bad things in wine. You you said um, I like wine. Yeah, your lesson is very long. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I didn't con I couldn't continue till the end, till, till you finish it. It is too long. Too long. It's so complicated for me. So maybe we should start in another way than just keep uh, in general, in general. Start, you know, keep having, ex trying with the things that we tried since uh, before, uh, sex before. So this might, might be my conclusion, and this might be the uh, way of to the future. Thank you. We have final remark, Sheikh uh, Samal. I feel like an interlocutor because I haven't really been here most of the time, but I've been provoked by my friend and colleague John and by my neighbor here to the right. But, uh, on, nation, on nation building, um, all I would observe is that like with people like Herrera has been doing the same, we have run a lot of dialogues among Syrians in order to help them find a way uh, towards out of their conflict and out of the bloodshed. But here's the problem, you can't do nation building if there isn't the space for it. And especially if you're looking over your shoulder, what dialogue is possible? Um, I'll give you an example. Last week, just a couple of days ago, we were in Berlin with a group of Syrians, all of whom have come from inside the country. None of them belong to the opposition, and they're not necessarily loyalists. But you can imagine the intrepidation that they still have in order to be able to express themselves in a way which would contribute to the process of nation building. To the, everything from the informal to the networking to the big legal constitutional uh, subjects and, uh, and, and instruments that uh, have to be delivered. So if you don't have, now that's a lesson not just for the Arabs, it's also a lesson for the outsiders because we have a responsibility, for example, in Syria to help create the space, the international legitimacy, the process whereby which nation building can take place. Too often, we have focused instead on trying to find the right side uh, with which to get behind. And in more recent history, it's whether it's a Karzai or a Maliki or and Abu Mazen or whatever else, that is where uh, we have ended up. Secondly, um, the process of decentralization. Um, again, last week we brought a group of, uh, of Syrians together who actually said, yes, we live in a fragmented uh, uh, vision now of three different uh, uh, of entities with different influence. But here's what we want from a process of decentralization. They were very, very clear. One was for it to help them to manage their diversity and build rights. Secondly, is to find a way to build equitable distribution, because 
many will complain. We're in oil areas, but it's the center that is getting all the resources. Third is to find ways to represent themselves. And the fourth is the rule of law, even in a decentralized system. So again, there has to be a structure and a method which you arrive at these things. Otherwise, uh, you will have fragmented realities. And that's not going to work for anyone. And let me just say on that, um, on nation state, on state building on nation, you can't just have nation building, you do have to have a state. And here I realize this, when you speak again to Syrians or to Yemenis or to others, the idea of losing their state and an identity of a state around them is horrible because then they are stateless in a world of states. Where do they go in that respect? It's, it's a very, um, it's a very de debilitating and worrying situation um, for, for them to be in. And finally, let me just say in terms of uh, uh, the final thing I was stressing to human resources. I would actually be, I spent a lot of time in the Gulf. And I will predict to you, if I was to look forward 25 years, there is a danger, it may not happen, there is a danger actually that the Gulf will start to fail. And it's because they haven't built up their human resources. 70 to 80% of Saudis are still not capable to be be playing an active role in the international system. And in the absence of building those human resources, um, no amount of current money is going to be able to build the kind of vibrant states long term um, that they need to. Thank you very much. Uh, and of course, we, uh, we need to give a possibility to our presenters and speakers to react to all the ideas expressed. Uh, so please, uh, any idea you like or, or question you like. Tomorrow. Um, so uh, let's start with uh, Nadia Bakar. Thank you. I have a very good comments. The first is regarding the uh, debate between uh, uh, why we should start first the nation building or the state building. I think uh, the evidence in Singapore, for example, by which uh, Lee Kuan Yew started by enforcing kind of, uh, of state over the, the nation now, see uh, how Singapore looks like. It's a great nation now. Uh, just uh, by following this, of course, it was a kind of dictatorship in way or another. But uh, by the end of the day, uh, we had a system on ground, um, uh, very efficient uh, state institutions that ended up with this uh, nation. The second insight in this uh, debate is why not to start in parallel uh, the two process, uh, processes? I mean, uh, building the nation, and because building a nation is, is very complicated, define the nation. For example, I have different uh, uh, points of view of views about uh, what the nation is. Islamists have their own uh, uh, interpretation of the nation. Arabs, uh, uh, Kurds, whomever. So, uh, and I think back to the Nash theory. If you want to uh, enhance uh, the national identity, uh, or even um, to enhance the behavior of. Uh, uh, the population in whatever uh, Arabic uh, state is, I think you should start with something like incentivizing them. In the long run, uh, you will get, uh, I think, good results regarding building a real immigration. The second thing is, instead of, uh, because I like very much, I like uh, the idea of uh, Germany uh, was uh, skeptical about the uh, role of technology uh, in the future. Actually, I want to substitute it with the data, uh, because through the technology is a tool. Through technology, you can uh, spread fake news, uh, and it happened in, in, in America, and you are accused of this, and it happened in our uh, region, and people are accused in, in our region that they are uh, very quick to pick any kind of rumors and um, uh, uh, building on, uh, on those rumors, uh, uh, whatever decision it is. So uh, instead of speaking about technologies, we want to speak about data, because we lack this kind of uh, informative decisions in the, in the region, the, the decision that is uh, more based on, on, on data rather than uh, guts or, or, or feelings. There is a, a very interesting book that I recommend for you uh, called Money More for Government. It's, uh, it, it comes after the, uh, the, the infamous movie, uh, Money Ball, 
So it's Manipur for government. It is uh, co-authored by like 13 uh, American authors. Half of them are Democrats and uh, the other half is uh, Republicans. And all of them served in a way or another with uh, uh, different uh, administrations. Some of them were, were uh, uh, Bush and the others were with uh, uh, Obama. And all of them uh, were very much emphasizing on the uh, the fact of depending on data and very solid data and how to make uh, informative uh, decisions out of those data. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, <coughs> yes, I just to remark that before I begin, uh, something about Bahrain. I'm mean, presenting Bahrain as a kind of model when there is this oppression against all, polit all political parties, hundreds of people in prison, torture, etc. seems to me really very strange. Concerning what Vasily said, I, am, I understand and I don't want to impose and to say there is only one model of economic and political development. There are many, many developments. But it must not be the pretext to say, okay, I mean, we are Arabs, or we are Muslim, we don't understand democracy, we don't understand all this, and we shouldn't put them in... Uh, and, Another remark which is linked with this, and I wanted to say it in... I said that the Westphalian system of state has not collapsed, but in crisis. One of the crises is the fact that before you had an internal box, I mean, the internal politics which was a, a black box. Something happening, you don't know what's happening, it was only state. Now you have citizens in each of the country which can look in the other country, what's happening? And I have a very good anecdote which say why it cannot continue like this. Just before the Arab Spring, there was in Jeddah flood. Every two or three years in Jeddah there are flood. Tens of people die. Every time the government decides to put two, three, four billion dollars to solve it, and every time this money, I don't know where it goes, but it not, doesn't go to, to, to solve this problem. And so a, a Saudi put a, on his website photo, one photo on two were the floods in, uh, in Jeddah. And one was Canada during a winter with three meters, four meters of snow, and the street was perfect and people circulating, etc. And it was very interesting because, I mean, a, a, a Saudi citizen was saying to his government, not we want the same system that in Canada, but we want our problem to be solved. And I think this, the fact that the people are aware that in other countries, some problems are solved and they are not in that country, I think it's a positive, but it's also very destabilizing for, uh, for some of the, uh, the government and the states. Thank you. Thank you. Um, briefly, when listening to Bahjad, all I thought to myself is I'm half Lebanese and he's Egyptian, and therefore our thinking about the state reflects those facts. Lebanese don't have a state, really, whereas <laughs> Egypt has had a state for thousands of years, and that, I think, affects thinking. But I actually didn't intend to uh, create this dichotomy exactly between... Singapore. Yeah, Singapore. exactly. But I didn't actually intend to create this dichotomy between nation-building and state-building, because you have to have a state, you have to have structures. But Let's forget nation building for a second. Let's think of um, the state as the structures, as hardware. You still need software. You need to have habits. Let's call them political culture or political habits. If those are poor, it doesn't matter what state you live in. It's not going to function. So forget nation building for a second. You, that's, that work is still there, which is how you develop competency, um, and the ability for the state to deliver its 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 its, its purposes. So let's forget nation building. That's still an issue. That's all I'll say because it's late. Okay. Thank you. Uh, very, very short comments. I uh, not everybody. Third, uh, there was a direct question about Shia. I mean, I think there are three factors. First, uh, Shia always was a. Uh, Way uh, to express uh, popular protest, Karmat, uh, Ismaili uh, movement, and so on. The second, a uh, failure of uh, other ideologies, Arab nationalism in uh, 1967, 
communism in the 1990s, so on. And that uh, uh, really, uh, uh, our Iranian friends, uh, they are very smart, but <laughs> uh, and, uh, uh, I think, uh, and uh, as to Bahrain, I, I, I should say, uh, maybe there are repressions, maybe, but at the same time, is that there, there is the most active civil society in Bahrain, and more active than, uh, is to Allah, than in other uh, Khalid states. And one of the most developed uh, societies, civil societies there. So I think that uh, it, we shouldn't be so uh, yes. <laughs> so radical enough. Thank you. So thank you, thank you very much, and uh, I congratulate you with this very fruitful discussion. Uh, I think that we somehow achieved to answer two famous Russian questions: uh, who or what to, is to be blamed and what is to be done. So at least with some hints of. Uh, the answers to these two questions, uh, and uh, I think that uh, it was one of the most uh, intense discussions over this uh, over these days. Uh, I'm sorry for stealing time from the wrap-up session, and uh, well, I I guess I wrote to Vladimir. Just two or three minutes of uh, <laughs> final uh, final comments and suggestions. As you probably have seen from the program with this uh, game of words that we tried to play uh, with the title, uh, it was done on purpose because we live uh, in the world of uh, essentially contested concepts uh, and uh, peace and state, peace and state building are one of them. Even future is definitely uh, contested as a concept because uh, we are uh, moving towards the system of alternative futures and scenarios, probably more than just one determined uh, future. Even if we, uh, if we exclude a lot of words from the program and leave uh, only Middle East, we would probably have the same kind of very intense argument uh, on what uh, Middle East meant and uh, what is supposed to, uh, to be. But uh, I think uh, what is uh, also uh, more important is I think we agree there is uh, one uncontested uh, point uh, in, uh, on this uh, program and on the cover of the whole thing. Is uh, Institute for Oriental Studies and its 20, uh, 20, 200, sorry, anniversary, which, uh, because of which this was uh, made possible uh, to bring you all here uh, and for a very intense discussion. And I hope that uh, next time probably when we meet in this audience and there will be only Institute of Oriental Studies with no title at all, with no concept written on, uh, on the program, you will still come uh, because uh, it will uh, give you some uh, food for thought that you are coming uh, to Moscow for. Uh, and there is one more uh, uncontested uh, thing which is basically doing something uh, good um, for, for those who are vulnerable, etc. And Vasily asked me to tell you this as well. The calendars that uh, were put uh, in the in the program uh, were is a part of a charity that uh, uh, Institute for Oriental Studies is uh, uh, doing, uh, helping uh, the mentally sick uh, children uh, to uh, to recover with, uh, uh, and these are. Uh, the uh, pictures that were uh, done by them. So this is a very special uh, thing and I think this is one more thing to congratulate our organizers to, uh, to do such an important uh, work uh, in this difficult time. So thank you all for uh, coming. I hope you enjoyed this, uh, this day.